our opinions are our opinions and that's that we're not trying to change yours so don't crucify us for ours This is MIA 2K Podcast, and we are your ticket from Miami to Seoul. We are your pilots, Kathy and Laura, two fun-seeking girls with obsessive fandom tendencies taking you on a ride through the Hallyu wave from our perspective as opinionated, grown Latina fans from Miami. Before we close the cabin doors, make sure you're following us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And if you like to watch, our in-flight podcast video is available on YouTube and Spotify. Once we reach our cruising altitude, we'll be serving one thing and one thing only, piping hot tea. We're ready to fly into today's topic with our hot and sunny takes. So fasten your seatbelt, sit back, relax, and prepare for takeoff. Hi, guys! So today, we will we'll finally be covering one of K-pop's most popular girl groups, Blackpink. We waited to talk about Blackpink because we wanted to know where they were going to land once their whole contract negotiation Lollapalooza situation was happening last year. <laughs> and now that we know where their status is as a group, as well as where three out of four of them are going in terms of their solo careers, we thought that this was the perfect time to talk about them. Full disclosure, we are not Blinks, which is a way to let you guys know that our commentary and opinions will not be coming from like a fangirl point of view this is the first time we'll be covering a group where we don't belong to the fandom and we think that will provide the episode with a little bit of spice and also a well-rounded objective perspective our opinions are our opinions and that's that we're not trying to change yours so don't crucify us for ours and with that so who is blackpink blackpink they debuted in August of 2016. They were YG's first girl group after 21. They had a, and they kind of still do have a girl crush concept, which mm -hmm. is based on female empowerment and self-confidence. All members did substantial work with existing YG groups prior to their debut. They were originally advertised as a seven to nine member group, but when Blackpink debuted, they debuted with four members, and their four members are Jisoo, the oldest. She was born in January 3, 1995, which makes her 29 years old. She has a couple of songwriting credits, one for Yeah, 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 <laughs> and Lovesick Girls. And to me, she's a fashion icon of the group. Makes sense. Makes sense. Then we have Jenny. She was born January 16th of 1996, which makes her right now 28 years old at the time of recording. She was born in South Korea. Then she moved to New Zealand until 15-ish when she was deciding whether to go to the U.S. to keep studying. And then she was like, actually, I want to be an idol. And then she went back to Korea and decided to audition. And Laura called Jisoo a fashion icon. I would call Jenny a controversial socialite is what I think defines her in terms okay. of just everything that is around her i think and you you guys will find out towards the second half of the episode why the controversial adjective was used in this instance and then she has lyrics and composing credits on loves like girls solo remix and the girls the third member is rose rosie she's born in february 11th 1997 so she's a 97 liner she's 27 years old she was born in new zealand raised in australia by south korean parents moved to south korea after auditioning she's a singer songwriter girly kind of like taylor swift olivia rodrigo so that's like her vibe very that and then finally last but not least in any stretch of the imagination we have lisa <laughs> Her birthday is March 27, 1997, so this year she'll be turning 27, and that makes it her golden birthday when you turn the, the number of your age on the day of that 
How do I say that? Cute. The number of your age on the number of the date. So she'll be 27th on the 27th. So it's her golden birthday this year, which is great for her. She was born in Thailand and developed a love of dance at a young age and moved to South Korea when she was 14 years old to pursue a music career. She is the dancer, period. End of story. <laughs> Enough. Like nothing else has to be said. And she was definitely born to be on stage, but even more importantly, through doing this research and working on this episode, she was born to be an idol specifically. Like, I think the way that she has handled and navigated everything that's been thrown at them, she literally, it's like easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Like she, this is what she was born to do. She can do it with no problem. And she has writing and composing credit on her collab SG, which uh, she did with DJ Snake, Osuna, and Megan Thee Stallion. Okay. So... With that, let's move on to their discography. Their discography has been very talked a about. A point of contention yeah. <laughs> between bl blinks and non blinks, like everybody. And before we go into that, we need to talk about one person who is extremely important yes, when it know. comes to Blackpink discography. Yes. yes. And that and is Teddy Park, I guess. The arch nemesis of blinks in a way <laughs> <laughs> depends on how much authority he actually ends up having or not so teddy is a korean american rapper songwriter and record producer he was born in south korea then his family moved to the u.s when he was a kid and then he was going back to korea for like summer vacation and decided to audition for yg entertainment with his friend danny they both got in right away and then they were part of a group called one time that ended up debuting in 1998 and Teddy was the primary songwriter and producer for that group. So after they disbanded, he became an in-house producer for YG. And then 10 years later, he ended up co-founding a label that's under YG called the Black Label. And we went into the whole YG and sub-label operation during our YG episode a few months ago. So if you want to know more about the structure of the company, the sub-labels and who is in charge of what and what artists are signed to what, Definitely go watch that episode, but the Black Label is under YG. And he has co-produced and co-written songs for YG artists, including Seven, Big Bang, 21, Lehigh, Blackpink, John Somi, Om Chung Wah, and Sun Mi. So very, 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 very prominent. So because Teddy is such a big part of Blackpink's discography and existence as a whole, he was actually also a very prominent part of their documentary that uh, came out on Netflix around 2021 called Blackpink Light Up the Sky. In that documentary, he said, our initial approach was more like single smash, single hit. Now we feel like we need to tell more of our personal story. And I know the fans are mad, like we want more, more, more. We do have a lot in here. And he pointed to his computer, but we're very particular with what we put out which I think a lot of the fans do resent him for not pushing out more music. And I think that shows even more because of the recent news that came out about a month ago that YG had hired a shit ton of in-house producers in order to speed up their music process and being able to put out more songs more that quickly. Makes so much sense. It does. They do have a number of producers that, that they work with. It's not just Teddy. Like, they've also worked right. with Vince and other people, but... It feels like there's a bottleneck situation where like they mm. might have a lot that they start with, but then if they have this one person at the top blocking the progress, it's not good for anybody mm. involved. Like, sure, you're that's putting true. out a certain quality that you're happy with, but the fans are not happy and that's who you have to make happy at the end of the day. Right. And then he also mentioned as another quote of just how unexpected the success of Blackpink was. He said, they're huge and they're so successful. I don't think any of us even expected this. Sometimes it gets to me like, oh, my God, how do we live up to this hype? And I, I do 100 percent empathize with that feeling. Like once you hit it so big and you weren't expecting to, it can really be a shock and paralyze you of like, what do I do next? Because you feel like no matter what you do, someone's going to be disappointed. So that feels very real. Yeah. And we've mentioned Teddy in his production for Blackpink in other episodes mm -hmm. when we talk about how Blackpink songs tend to have a very 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 set like formula mm -hmm. in making them and as soon as you hear it you know it's a Blackpink song which is not always bad but in the case for Blackpink for me they just all sound 
too similar mm. you get what I mean like I get having like a, a sound that you're known for mm -hmm. but having that versus just sounding the same every single time is different to me and it's not just sounding but like the following of the song structure like everybody has choruses verses bridges whatever but there's something about their approach that's even more just copy paste in in the format of the song right so that's I think where part of our struggle has been into like finding their music actually exciting right and just so to, I guess to paint the picture completely mm -hmm. and to show I guess how particular they are with Blackpink and their releases mm -hmm. they've been active for I guess about seven years seven and a half years at this point sure right and in that time they've only released these two studio albums they released three EPs, five single albums, 12 singles, four promotional singles, one reissue, one compilation album, and four live albums, which sounds like a lot to like a Western music listener. Yeah. But when you're in K-pop, this is not a lot. It's not. And I, I went and personally counted. I, I might be off by a couple of songs here and there, but I went and counted how many original songs there are like not like korean version and japanese version and that kind of stuff right. or like live remix. version remix whatever sure and i only counted 33 like individual songs yeah and their studio albums only had eight tracks each yeah. which is usually not the norm for studio albums right, right. usually like 10 or more right Right. Yeah, EPs or or, or um, mini albums have about six. So it yeah. just it's like in a weird, weird place. You know what I mean? It is. It is. I think we can like stop here and share a little bit of our thoughts now that we shared the facts and and why we struggle at times with just thinking about how Blackpink has accomplished so much, but the output doesn't match what other people in their generation in their years in their line of work like Laura said k-pop versus the west it doesn't really line up so the big groups that we follow and let i don't want to start with naming names because i think it's gonna start a fan war and we're not even five minutes in yeah <laughs> but just in general you know if you think about let's say komka right the people that are at the top of the list of komka most of them at this point have over 100 song credits and most of them are in Gen 3. There's a couple of Gen 4 and some older people there, Gen 2, Gen 1. And so to see that they, between the four of them, barely have like 10 song credits for their songs in the terms of like lyricism or composing, it sucks because it feels like YG didn't focus on that on like building that part of their artistry when they were training them they right. focus a lot on performance they focus on serving they focus on the fashion and on their chemistry but i don't think that they gave them a lot of room to grow in songwriting and that just and it makes sense because in the case of 21 with cl we saw that she had a lot less credits while she was with yg and she mm -hmm. wasn't really able to grow until she left the company. So it adds up with what we know of YG in terms of how they work with women and the, the girls that are assigned to them. And so I just think it's unfortunate. And it is puzzling to see that a group has reached such heights without doing the work that many other groups have put in. Because I think that the number one thing that Laura and I stand on this channel is hard work and talent like whenever that's yeah. there we are 100 here for it and not that blackpink hasn't worked hard they have but yeah. but i don't think yg did right by them in not letting them or polishing them in the right. songwriting department because maybe they wouldn't have been victims to teddy and his uh right. production timelines or perfectionism et cetera, et cetera. because i feel like I mean, you don't always have to be a songwriter or like a producer to right. sing songs, right? Mostly in K-pop, they're not. Like that's right. really the anomaly. And, and we know, and we know that 
an artist can be successful and show who they are without writing their own songs. Yeah. Like, for example, not to name names, but Temin comes to mind. Yeah. Like, his discography, his output um, artistically does feel like it's very much chosen by him or like a, a big part of it is because of him. Yeah. He has a and brand and a sound that he can identify in the songs that are like shown to him. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I'm not saying all four of them need to do right. these things, but yeah. I feel like, for example, Rosé, she would want to do this. Yeah. She's the one that is more musically inclined out of the four. Yeah. She plays instruments like like I called her the singer songwriter yeah. girly of the group yeah, yeah. because that's that's the vibe she gives. So sometimes it just feels like they did a disservice for her because they didn't allow her to grow artistically, especially if if that's what she really wanted to do, which I at least that's the vibe that I get. Again, we're not blink so I don't know that well, but yeah. that's the vibe that that at least she's trying to put out to everyone. So that's what I was going to say. It's not just that we're picking up on that vibe. That's what she's putting down. So I rewatched the documentary because I had actually watched it back in 2021 when I was just starting to like become more of like a K-pop interested person. And I wanted to see how it felt from a different perspective now as like a seasoned K-poppy. And there's a couple like they do focus a few minutes on her in the studio. And I think they recorded this yeah. along 2018, 2019. So she's there with Teddy and Vince because she was I it's funny how she said it because she was like, oh, I asked Teddy if I could work with Vince. And it, it was kind of like she's literally a hostage to Teddy, like they are hostages to Teddy. And they were looking to work with someone else just to explore what else they could do. And she was playing with chords that sounded really nice, like with like songs that she would like and people would like as well. And she was scared to go into the booth and like do a melody or this. do like a top line or do this and teddy was like you have to be vulnerable and you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable in the recording booth and it's like yeah well but it's hard because now she's been three years thrown into stardom and doing world tours and everything that they do is observed and criticized and dissected under a microscope so how is she going to have the confidence now to start that process of being vulnerable right. in the studio she didn't right. have a choice she didn't right. she didn't start it at the right time so right. yeah i i think the blame to for lack of a better word here for their lack of music output and for their lack of credits goes 100 percent to yg right and i mean another thing to note and to keep in mind which we both fully understand we get that during their active times or during their rise to fame, YG was involved in the Burning Sun scandal, which did push out a lot of the output for their artists, their active artists. Now, it wasn't just Blackpink. It was also Treasure that got kind of put in a back burner for all of 2019 in terms of like music production because of all the things that were happening within YG. But at the same time, this was this their saving their biggest, grace. Yeah, this is their biggest group. This is what kept them from dying as a company, right? Yeah. So, like 2019 was one of the years that took Blackpink again to the next level after that world tour. So, right. this was the one thing that YG had going for them at, at this right. scale because they still have Winner at the time, they still had the rest of the members of Big Bang. They still had, I think Sai left around 2018. So they still had a lot of talent at the time, but not the scale, not the scale right. that they had with Blackpink. And, and and part of the reason why they had that scale, which I think is a good segue to the next point, mm. is because YG was so badly looked at in Korea, they had to go international if they wanted to keep the company afloat. And they chose Blackpink as the group to like put all their chips on put exactly yeah so that kind of leads into talking about black pink's trajectory and like rise to fame right yeah because it's been pretty big it's been <laughs> medi meteoric almost like yeah not to say that you know, that they rose too fast but they again in the documentary were showing how within 14 days of their debut they got their first music show win 
Like they were doing one of their first performances and they got a win, which just to put it into perspective, there's a group we do follow closely called P1 Harmony and it's 2024. They debuted in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic and people were doing the count. They just won their first music show win and it's been three years. I don't know how many months, how many days, how many people were counting down to like the hours and the seconds from the time that they debuted until they won their first music show. They're really talented. So it's not for lack of talent. Super talented. They're doing the K-pop thing with mm-hmm. coming back every six months or so. They're doing world tours back to back. They're not really resting at all. They mm-hmm. have two international members, one that caters to Japan, one that caters to the entire world because he speaks English. <laughs> so, you know, particularly Canada, Australia, and again, all English speaking countries. So they have all the elements that you need to really kind of go very quickly, but they haven't gone very quickly. They've gone up right. steadily. So Blackpink's rise really was actually meteoric. Like people just latched onto them and it just something about them was magic and worked. So To talk about and to put into perspective these meteoric moments for them. I don't think I have another word for... Yeah, no, there isn't. We're going to talk about some of their firsts. Mm. So, again, they debuted in August of 2016. In November, they became the first K-pop girl group on the Canadian Hot 100. Then in June of 2018, they reached three different Billboard charts records. They first got (laughs) do-do-do-do... To number 55 (laughs) on the Hot 100, which was at the time the highest charting hit ever by a K-pop girl group on the chart. On the Billboard 200, their sophomore EP Square Up debuted at number 40 to become the highest charting album by an all-female K-pop group at the time. And as emerging artists, they debuted at number one on the chart, becoming the first female K-pop group to do so. So that was a very, very big deal. Then July of the same year, we're talking about 2018. They reached the most viewed Korean music video on YouTube. Again, Hit You with the Do 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 snagged 36.2 million views in its first 24 hours to become the most viewed Korean music video of 2018 at that point. And it was the fastest one by a K-pop girl group to earn 100 million views, accomplishing the feat in only 10 days. Those numbers at that time, incredible. Ridiculous. And I, I love that. So many of the things that have broken YouTube came from K-pop. Like, I remember when Gangnam Style broke YouTube. I think it's still one of, like, top five highest viewed videos. It it reached, like, 10 billion views last year or something like that for its 10-year anniversary. Maybe the year before. I don't know. But I I love that all these records are always taken on by K-pop. In January of 2019, Hechu with the Tutu snagged the YouTube record when the video pulled in a huge number of eyeballs. With 620.9 million views, the video now became the most viewed music video by a K-pop group, period, at the time, which is crazy. Those are big words. In March, they became the first female K-pop artist on a Billboard cover. Also in March, they Hmm. were the first K-pop group to reach 20 million YouTube subscribers. In April, they had the biggest music video debut on YouTube, which happened with Kill This Love. The video dropped on April 5th. It pulled in 56.7 million views in its first 24 hours and got to the 100 million views in less than three days. It took them 10 days the time before, and it took them literally three days this time which is actually ridiculous and the video had a an astounding 979,000 peak concurrent which set a record at the time so that's almost a million people watching at the same time which is amazing in april also of 2019 they became the first k-pop girl group to perform at coachella they not only became the first uh, k-pop girl group to play the annual festival but they were also one of the main acts on opening day so they were playing towards nighttime which we know are the more coveted spots for artists to perform also in april they set more records for the billboard charts hot 100 with kill this love they it debuted at 41 and it became the highest charting hot 100 song by a k-pop girl group at the time which was held by themselves with Tutututu. And for the Billboard 200, the Kill This Love EP debuted at number 24, making it the highest charting title by an all-female K-pop group. In August, they were the first K-pop girl group recognized by the RIAA, which is the Recording Industry Association of America. So that means like they were really doing the crossover thing in the West internationally. 
in November, they became the first K-pop group video with 1 billion YouTube views. So we had Psy was a soloist. They were the first group to reach right. the milestone. In June of 2020, they had the biggest music video premiere on YouTube again with How You Like That, which was absolutely a serve. It reached 1.66 million peak concurrence on YouTube. And it pulled in 86.4 million views in like 24 hours, beating the record that they said with Kill This Love and the year before with Rututu. So they just keep beating themselves. Beating themselves, yeah. Then also in June of 2020, they set three Guinness World Records, which were for the video How You Like That. They, they set that record, as we just mentioned. So they had the most viewed YouTube video in 24 hours, the most viewed music video on YouTube in 24 hours and most view YouTube music video in 24 hours by a K-pop group. So the Guinness World Records gave them those three awards in that go. And those awards were previously held by BTS. In July of 2020, they became six act to surpass the 40 million subscribers, making them one of the musical acts with the most followers. They trailed only Justin Bieber, Marshmello, Ed Sheeran, and Eminem, which is a lot. Big, big names there. In July, they had the highest single by a girl group on digital song sales, which was How You Like That. Then in August, they were the first female K-pop group to win a VMA, which is a dream for every musician to be winning yeah. VMAs. I don't think that they had an award show that they could go to that year, right? Because it was 20, 2020, so yeah, there well, wasn't anything. 2020 was weird. 2020 didn't exist. We canceled yeah. it. Yeah. Then September 2021, most subscribed artists on YouTube. So, I mean, the list goes on. The point here is to say they set some incredible milestones and they surpass themselves every single time with every drop, which I think is the first goal that anyone should ever have. It's the competition is not outside, it's inside, it's, it's with you. So even with the fact that they weren't putting out a lot of music and the fact that they were hostages to their one producer what they were putting out was resonating with the fans. And it all culminated in April of last year, April 2023, when they were headliners for Coachella this time. Correct. So it's crazy to me. It is. And we can stay <laughs> also here a little bit and talk about Coachella just because I remember watching it. I made a point to watch it because, again, we're not blinks, but because we are K-popies and because we do have a podcast we like to be informed and keep a, an ear and an eye out on whatever is going on. So I remember watching it and I thought a few things. The set list was, I think I still have the notes on my phone that I was taking when I was like watching the performance because I was that like, would be very you. Yeah, that would be very me to keep receipts and never delete things. Yes, that would be very me. So I was keeping notes because I wanted to sound too louder the next day and be like, this is what I thought of. Here, Blackpink Coachella thoughts. Ah, this was sorry. like the last time that I checked it was, yeah, April 23 of 2023. Yeah, that's like that night that I wrote it. Yeah. So, oh, okay. So they had a drone show at the beginning, which was seven minutes and it was super confusing what was happening. Like there was like a lot of cute shapes, but it lasted too long. And everybody was kind of like, we just want to see Blackpink at this point. Like I remember I started writing down, but not, not I remember, I'm looking at the fact that I started writing down the shapes that the drones were making. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? Like, is this supposed to mean something? There's a hand with a round orb, a snail, a butterfly. Like, is this supposed to tell us like what the set list is about? Like, I didn't understand. <laughs> what the drone show was about but they literally took seven whole minutes from their show <laughs> to start with some like drone shit which i was not like appreciating then blackpink has tapped kyle tootin he's a dancer from new zealand he used to dance with paris global and then he went out on his own and they've tapped him to do a lot of choreographers for them and so he i think i believe he choreographed part of their tour or like because the choreographers these days do also like creative direction. So I think he was the creative director for the tour. And then in the mm. middle of the tour, they had to do Coachella. So they redid the set list and redid the creative production part to give a different experience at Coachella. So he was there. He was dancing. I put camera work, but I don't remember if it was good or bad. Sorry about that. I put week two <laughs> outfits versus week two. Oh, because I watched it the second week again. Like I really wanted to like form a, a very informed and uh, solid opinion here. I put Rosé's uh, black shorts were distracting. Oh, because, you know, the, the whole, like, the black shorts under, like, the safety shorts. I'll never understand why they don't use, like, skin tone things. Because yeah, 
like it's just it just makes it sometimes it fits other times it doesn't you know i it's probably not a wholesome reason yeah no it's not wholesome i mean well for them yeah. it makes sense because like their outfits were black and pink because black pink right, right so right. like it didn't not fit completely but i i, I made a point to write it down yeah, which means like it bothered me so i think the first week they were not able to have the hand in sync when they came out to like like their opening pose but the second week they were because i put it here and i uh -huh. put sync and moves were steady at 80 percent. mics were on but the backing tracks with the live like lar were pretty loud i put fell for jenny's seductive intro before how you like that on week one hotter <laughs> on week two it wasn't a sea of blink bongs as expected I remember being shook by the lack of, of light sticks at yeah, the event. Yeah. And I'm sure some people were like, didn't want to carry their light sticks all day at Coachella. Totally yeah. fair. But based on other festivals we've seen, like in Lollapalooza, there was TXC. We saw New Jeans. We saw J-Hope. I've seen more light sticks at festival crowds yeah. than what I saw that night. Yeah. And especially because it was nighttime. So you could see even more. And there wasn't and a lot pink, of light sticks. Pink is pink. Is pink. It, like you and can see and pink. their light sticks have two bulbs on right, either side. Right, it's not just right, one. So right. it's double the light that should be coming from the crowd. The and it wasn't the there. Stick. Yeah. I put I love the Illuminati stage because I think they had a lot of triangles going on. <laughs> and not a lot of shots where you can see all four to tell how synced they actually are. So I think they had a lot of camera shots where they were focusing on each of them when they were singing. And uh, it feels like they're better with older songs, which makes sense, I put. So I right. guess like when they practice their choreos more back in the day, they still have that muscle memory that came back, but they don't they don't have that that chemistry or that glue with the newer songs which again makes sense so i wrote a lot more which also is very on brand for me i wrote down like in the in the men's they said as you can see we're giving you guys everything that we have jisoo was speaking korea and rose translated for her and jisoo i put jisoo cursing in english is so cute <laughs> she's so cute though she's so, she is the best cute. i love jisoo's I... sense of humor i love everything like her personality is it it's that She's so I, uh, I I think something that can be said about us and again in line with the whole like we're not blinks we're not blinks but I think we're very objective about them and I think we can appreciate their individuality more than yeah. we can appreciate them in the group yes 100 percent. I think we're fans of them as people and as individuals and they're in and yes. like their their individual talents but I don't think we feel that pull that blinks feel feel for them as right. a group right. and that I think a that's a good one I because hit it on the nail because I know that we talk about all of them individually and we can like I, I, again we can appreciate Rose's like Taylor Swift Olivia Rodrigo vibe and we know that she's talented at like singing songwriting playing instruments all these things but her within Blackpink doesn't make as much no. sense to us no. so yeah. yeah there's that's on period yeah. thank you to meet from April 23 2023 for taking <laughs> notes at the Coachella <laughs> watching party that I had by myself two weekends in a row uh, but yeah so that that performance it was good I enjoyed it I thought it was a really good show of their mm -hmm musicality and their discography from 2016 until now they hit us with all the classics they had their solo stages because at that point Jisoo had already come out with flowers so they all had something to offer individually and I think by that point they were already on tour so there were already yeah. videos going on of the tour now being 100% energy and not giving us everything that we have so it stood out to everyone how at Coachella, they did give us everything that they had. And we'll talk about that right. a little bit more. And speaking of tours, we wanted to mention the tours that they have gone on because when they go on tour, they go on tour. They don't go yeah. home. And then they're like, we already went to Thailand, but we're going to go to Thailand again with the same tour because we can't. And so their, their tour is going to go on like almost double the time because yeah. of how they structure them. So they went on the Black Pink Arena tour in 2018, which started July 24, 2018 and ended December 24, 2018. They had eight shows in Japan alone, which was crazy. Then they had the In Your Area World Tour, which started November 10, 2018. So they started this tour before finishing the other one, is what I'm saying. Like, again, they go, <laughs> they go back and around uh, because oh, the Jesus, tour started with, like, Asia. So they were already in Japan. So I think, like, this kind of 
They went back and forth. November 10th, 2018 until February 22 of 2020. So I think if the pandemic hadn't set in, they would still be on that tour. I swear (laughs) to God, they would still be going around with the same tour. This tour had 36 shows and it grows $56 million. And uh, 472,000 people went to see it. And then the Born Pink World Tour... They started it October 15, 2022, and ended it September 17, 2023. So that was almost a year, like yeah. by a month. 66 shows. So yeah. double what they did before in less time than what they had before. They grossed $148,300. Uh, and I think that's only counting 29 out of 66 shows. I don't know where the rest of the that's money crazy. is. It's being shady. And they saw they <laughs> they in attendance they made it to a million eight hundred thousand people, which is a lot yeah. of people. That that's why, like we we can't. I don't think anybody can or should say that they don't work hard. Like no, th- no that's no. a lot of fucking touring. Like, yeah, that and will fuck you up. <laughs> and they were they were exhausted. You could see again in the documentary on Netflix. They did focus. Oh, I wanted to say this about the documentary on Netflix, if I'm allowed. Your honor, please uh, may I approach the bench. I feel like when it comes to male group documentaries and female group documentaries, they paint different pictures. Like they want you to, they focus on different things. They had a whole two minutes that they focus on like, our fashion senses are so diverse because blah, blah, blah. But we also look good together. And it's like, okay. And like, we know that that's very obvious to me. And I was like, why did you waste two minutes of precious Netflix money on this shot? Like, I don't, I just don't get it. On them trying on black and, and white clothes, like on top of it. Like if they had been showing like a photo shoot or something avant-garde in any way. Yeah. But it was like one of those like white button downs with like a black corset <laughs> on top. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, it wasn't mm-hmm. giving what anything. And I just feel like they talked a lot about the hard work and stuff. But it didn't show at the same time. Like they had a lot of interviews okay. and they had, but and like they talked about it. We could see they were upset. We could see they were tired. We could see that they were jet lagged and they missed home. But it, but they also didn't show it. And it might be because, yeah. you know, women are bad at showing when we're actually in pain and we're really good at hiding it. Yes. And it might also be what you said about like the difference in what they're trying to sell us with a boy group documentary yeah. versus a girl group because in every single boy group documentary i've seen you get shots of them coming backstage with the mask on and then the, the sweat and the crying yeah. and the and i guess like they don't want to show them in that light they didn't they never want us to know that women could look like they're out of breath or sweating <laughs> like they just don't want us to see that they, like that's yeah. my only explanation because You're if so right. someone should have footage of someone coming off stage tired it's Blackpink. 66 shows in a year. Thank you. Like a Plus whole year. solo activities, like outside of Blackpink. All of their engagements, shows. all of their stuff. Like, I can't. I can't. So, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's my crazy. note on the documentary. That's now you know any, everything about the tours. And uh, again, we'll touch on the tour situation now because now. we have arrived <laughs> at the scandals. You guys know that on these episodes <clears throat> where we cover groups, when we cover agencies, we like to cover all the bases and a very important base to cover is the scandals because we're all human and this is just part of the daily life. We're not hashing anything or rehashing anything. We're just sharing the information because we do have a lot of people who messages on Instagram, by the way, thank you all for sending us these cute messages yeah. that tell us that you guys are new to K-pop, that you're learning through us. And we do want to make this educational and informational for everybody mostly entertaining over the information that was gonna say, but also very fun yeah. yeah mostly entertaining but yeah so we do want to include this information just so people kind of have an idea of what the struggles of these people have been so with that let's start with jesus scandals and we'll be ping-ponging back and forth yes this. we will so with jisoo <laughs> we're gonna start with the scandal that i'm calling cell phone case picture in 2021 <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just by the title of it, you can tell where this is going to stupid town, right? So spicy meter in terms of scandals, ice, like Antarctica, (laughs) (laughs) pretty much the lowdown is poor Jisoo posted a picture of her phone case. Like she took a selfie, right? On a mirror and you could see the phone case. She wanted to show it. It was a cute phone case. And people started 
bashing her, calling her unloyal and all of these things just because she had been a spokesperson for Samsung. Please note that her contract had ended a full year before. So she literally had no contractual obligations at all to still be using Samsung products. Literally, who gives a shit? Let her show off her cute phone case. Like, yeah, it's only because she's a woman. Literally, the second scandal, and I think this is going to show or this is going to be a recurring theme with Blackpink scandals. Mm. Um, the second scandal that I could find for Jisoo was there was dating rumors with Son Kyumin. I'm butchering that name. I 100% know. The soccer player. <laughs> <laughs> the captain of the South Korea fo- uh, soccer team, yes. And spicy meter, mild kimchi. That's because... the only one that I can have. <laughs> <laughs> because the only one I can hear me out. The only reason that there were scandals or like this was even a thing is because netizens were netizens everywhere, right? (laughs) Jisoo posted a picture of a Tottenham game. So that we're like, oh my God. Which I'm sure all, all the all the boys, all the boys were posting about and all the K Hip Hop community was posting about. And but she posted it. Right. Like if you go to England, you go to a game. And why wouldn't you go to a game of people from your country and you want to support someone? Yeah, of course. Especially someone that famous. Right. (sighs) Netizens also looked through like a billion pictures and they saw what they thought were like matching bracelets again. Like, okay, And then the cherry on top of why people thought that they were dating was because they just so happened to fly back to Korea from different places on the same day. Wow. So that had to mean. Sherlock Holmes, all of you. (laughs) And in a rare case, which is why I made it like mild kimchi. In a rare case, YG Entertainment took a firm stand and said that they were not dating because usually their statements are very like, well, yeah, that's their private life. We can confirm or deny type of thing. So this time they took like a firm like, no, please keep that in the back of your minds, everyone. What Laura just said about (laughs) YG statements, because this is also a recurring theme. It's going to come up a lot through the next scandals. (laughs) <laughs> and then the final scandal, which again goes to a dating one. It was her dating, I can't pronounce his name. He's an actor, An Bo Hyung. I'm going to go with. I named it Spicy Meter Gochu Chang. The only reason is because he's really hot. <laughs> if you guys are K drama watchers, you know he's really hot. Mm. Delicious. And oh, anyway, so basically, why this rumor started was because this patch released photos of them dating. Wasn't even a rumor. It was like fully <laughs> <Yeah>. on display. <laughs> In August of 2023, so last year. And you really can't deny photographic evidence. So they both confirmed our relationship. But I think um, that was orchestrated because you know, you know that by the time this patch so. puts it out, they've already Ooh. offered the company not to put it out for a certain amount of money. That's true. So that's true. either they did it on purpose, like I mean, either YG let it run on purpose of like they wanted this publicity for Jisoo for whatever reason, or they just didn't care to deny it at that point, and uh, or to or to pay the money, and they were just <sighs> like, yeah, let it run. So they had their statement prepared because it came out right after the dispatch shit came I out. I love that because I haven't thought of this. Mm. August twenty twenty three. What is that? They're the time that they were supposed contract. to renew their contract. Right. They Diversion. wanted people. Right. Right. Deflection. Because Blackpink not signing their contract isn't just oh they're just leaving. That means money. Like mm. a lot of money mm-hmm. for YG. So that you're right. Yeah. I remember oh thinking God. about it at the time in terms, not about the YG knowing stuff, because I just, I've always worked in communication. So PR shit, like I'm always thinking about the companies doing yeah. shady shit behind the scene, not that. But I remember thinking, like, wow, we've reached the point where YG is admitting to her relationship in the middle of contract negotiations. Like they can't hold this over her head. She's like, I'm going to live my life and you guys need me. So bye. That was that. Though a couple months later in October, they both announced their breakup. So, you know, I didn't I didn't know this until I read the notes for the episode when you did your thing. I didn't know that they had broken up. I thought they were still together. 
No, no, it was pretty sad. I, I was, I was and sad lightning fast. Yeah, he, he's, he's really hot, and that's really <laughs> sad. <laughs> because I want, I want the best for Chisu. Yeah, because man, she deserves. She's that. great. She so you know, I, that. I really just wanted the best. And in terms of looks, he looks really good. Yeah, so he I'm does. sure she's. She has like so fine options, butter. you know. It's fine. It's but fine. But still, you know, it was just maybe like, he wasn't well, all that he's cracked up to be, and she deserves <gasps> better, and she's gonna get it. Mm, I, I know. I'm sorry. So. I didn't want to say that, but hope so. <laughs> so that that's pretty much it for Jisoo. Like she really didn't have a lot going on. It's it was really I'm gonna rate it, and it's gonna be a boring <laughs> because they're really not scandals. Like they're not. <laughs> she's just being a human. Like, Literally just living her, her life, taking a picture like, of her cell phone case. Like it doesn't get any more relatable than that. Yeah, like literally let her live. Seriously. She works hard. Like let her date whoever she wants to date. I anyway, can't. That's Jesus. <laughs> okay. So we're moving on to Jenny. Now remember that I named her a controversial socialite, and it was for this exact reason. She has a lot more scandals than Jisoo, a lot more juicy er than Jisoo's scandals. And so I'm gonna try to go as quickly as possible. So the first <clears throat> scandal that she had, bullying. It's like what idol hasn't had a bullying scandal? Spicy meter though, not even ketchup. You know how some people think ketchup is spicy? <laughs> not that. People think ketchup is some spicy. people do think ketchup is spicy. <laughs> it's crazy. Know. Yeah. So the lowdown is. Jenny was still a trainee, and then some people started saying that she had made discriminatory comments towards other Asians when she lived in New Zealand, but then no one really came forward confirming the allegations, so it died down. But then somebody brought it back up again, and then somebody brought it back up again later. So it's something that's kind of come back to haunt her, which is why I mentioned that we're not trying to rehash anything. We're just trying to mention the amount of times that these people have been dragged through the mud because it's i could not survive i i could not do what these Literally. people do at all q frozen let it go please stop bringing this shit up and that's that next scandal is sexy nurse outfit and the lovesick <clears throat> girls mv spicy meter is the dna tests are in and you all need a heavy dose of bffr okay be fucking for real thank you <laughs> So, okay, no, there's there's actually one point of validity here, okay? So when the video came out, there's a scene where Jenny was dressed in a sexy nurse outfit, like very Halloween style. Some people were saying on Reddit, it was like a psychiatric nurse and it was like very, people were complaining about different things. So once the fans like started talking about it, it just became like a big deal, but it got so, so, so big that the Korean Health and Medical Workers Union ended up criticizing the video. Now, keep in mind, this is where the one valid point is at. This video came out in 2020 at the peak of the pandemic where uh, health professionals were struggling, okay? Like, yeah. it was a really tough time. Their mental health, physical health, everything was at a low. And then it's like, people don't take us seriously. There's people that are denying the vaccine, people that are denying science, and we're already not taken seriously. So this video actually didn't help our cause. Right. So they had a very valid claim in that regard. Like, I don't I don't care what the fans thought or didn't think. Like, I think they're complaining for no reason. But I do understand right. why the Korean <laughs> Health and Medical Workers Union made that statement, especially when you consider the timing. So YG came out after the statement from the Korean Health and Medical Workers Union statement had come out. And they said the scene in the Lovesick Girls MV depicting a nurse and a patient portrays a lyric which read, no doctor could help when I'm lovesick, right? So it, they had like this very literal interpretation for the MV. But even after that statement, the criticisms continued. So YG ended up editing out the scene and they stated that they were backing healthcare professionals and they were behind them, which was the right thing to do. So right. it is what it is. But that happened. Next scandal, Lazy Dancing Gate is what I'm calling this one because so the spicy meter is she could use some NCT Dream hot sauce. Sorry, not sorry. So the lowdown is that this isn't a scandal <laughs> for everyone not watching Laura's time. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a scandal, but rather a prevalent theme and complaint from concert attendees and netizens <laughs> alike from 2018 until now. She often dances at much lower energy levels than the rest of the group and has walked off stage often for short periods or for even the remainder of the show. 
Many of the group's fans defend her due to her claims that she's always sick, but for many others, her inconsistent performances call for her departure from the group. Jenny has said, when you see me looking tired and grumpy, that's my happy face, which is kind of a fuck you to people in a way, which like, <laughs> I low-key stand, low-key, <laughs> because like RBF, <laughs> like, you know, sometimes we do, we do podcast episodes and I look at myself like during edits and I'm like, why do I look like I'm dying? And it's just because I'm processing <laughs> shit in my head. So having RBF doesn't necessarily mean that you're not enjoying yourself, but in the concert, when you're like on stage and yeah. trying to give people like a good the best two hours or three hours of their year for them seeing a resting bitch face means that you're not having fun which means they are not having fun there's also recently in the last tour i saw a lot of tiktoks of jenny like antagonizing the people and being like put your phones down and it's like that's how people enjoy concerts nowadays you can't really tell yeah. them to put their phones down because like she's done it at some concerts for like a song like this song everybody put their phones on i don't want to see a single phone whatever but she mentions it a lot she says it uh, like throughout the cities and at the end of the day like those videos are the ones that end up making it on tiktok criticizing right. her for her lazy dancing so there's another motive you could say for her request for putting phones down and if you go to our blog after or during watching this episode there's a tiktok that i included of someone being extremely shady and putting the percentage challenge with Blackpink. So you know when like groups have a comeback and they're like someone's dancing at 150%, someone's dancing at yeah. 10, and someone's dancing at one. Well, Blackpink was not participating in that challenge. They were doing a normal <laughs> choreo, but it almost looks like they're doing the percentage challenge yeah. because they're all on different pages. So right. if you want to look at that, definitely check out our blog. You'll find a link from the description below. So and I was going to say, this doesn't really just apply to Jenny. This also applies to Jisoo and Rosé. They also get slapped with these allegations. Yeah, dragged. Um, so <laughs> yeah, Jisoo, Jisoo is nicknamed Stiffsu very rudely by people because she's not as fluid as uh, Lisa. And I don't know if Rosé has a, has a nickname. I haven't seen people no. calling her something specific. I think, unfortunately for them, they're in a group with Lisa. And Period. that's, that's, that's Period. where you can really see. Because Period. as Kathy mentioned earlier, Lisa was born to perform and dance. And she does that yeah. really well. And, and, and wants everyone to know that she's, even if she's not having fun, she's going to show you that she's having fun. Oh, yeah. And so the difference, the contrast is pretty jarring. Yeah. Just as a point of reference for people, when you're an idol trainee, you go through monthly evaluations and most trainees dread it because it means that you could get cut at the end of the program and mm -hmm. you could lose your dream. Lisa would look forward to it. She thought they were fun. And that's something that I've only heard coming from her. Like I only heard her as someone saying that trainee evaluations were fun like i've never heard that from any other idol so she's just built different and yeah, like good truly. for her this is the life that she was born for truly. another scandal violation of social distancing rules spicy meter you know how some people think that pepper is spicy yeah so she wasn't wearing a mask in a picture while she was out with her friends eating ice cream and this was in 2021 when south korea still hadn't lifted mask mandates we went to south korea in 2022 they still hadn't lifted the fucking mask mandates so yeah, she was kind of fucked. That's the whole scandal. I mean, she was eating ice cream. Like, it's not like she went to a nursing home, you know? Like, what? Like, I, don't, I don't understand. I just don't understand. Kinda, like, I don't know. Spread I don't the ice it. cream on her face. Like, whatever. I'm, whatever. It is what it is. <laughs> and now, this scandal is kind of long, so I split it into two. One is her dating life, and one is her dating one specific person, because mm. that's the tea. So, spicy meter... She's the type of girl that is ready for love, so she's constantly playing with fire, only to kill this love and end up going so low until it's you and me time again. Thank you. Wow. Thank you that so much. So good. For female K-pop <laughs> idol standards, though, this Gochugaru is straight up pink venom. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm a poet. What can I say? Sorry. Wow. I, I got inspired. I got inspired because Jenny's dating life just is everything the lowdown is first she was photographed out on a date with kai from exo in december of 2018 they're so hot together oh my god 
They're so hot. I miss them so much. I miss them terribly. (laughs) He has like another year and a half left. I'm going to die. So they were photographed together while out on this date in December of 2018, which led to death threats for both of them, but mostly on her side because Korea is very sexist and misogynistic. So, of course, love that for us. YG, in typical YG fashion, (laughs) hid under a rock and left SM to confirm the relationship. (laughs) Their relationship actually ended up ending shortly after in january literally the month after like i don't think they survived the publicity of it all and they said that it ended because of their schedules like we just couldn't match together which makes sense because it was around the tour time so she was probably never in town so that was that with kai then dispatch claims that jenny started dating g dragon in february of 2021 they were caught going really? on routine secret dates at G Dragon's villa in Seoul. And then in May of 2022, he reportedly unfollowed her on Instagram. And that's how we all got confirmation that they were no longer they allegedly were friends dating. I didn't hear about the dating sc- like rumors. Well, Crazy. and then this is what leads into the next scandal, which is part of Ooh, this one, too. I love so it. this is the scandal of Jenny dating V of BTS. So if you don't know this, if you haven't been on Twitter, (laughs) if you haven't been on social media, there's something that's a part of K-pop that I despise, which is fan wars. Okay. And if there's a fan war that is hella toxic is Blinks versus ARMY. And when these rumors started, Twitter was hell. Okay. It was not okay. I was not okay (laughs) being on Twitter. So spicy meter, not even dispatch touched this one, okay? Maybe because I bought them, but that's different. Allegations Ooh. or whatever. Anyway, so the lowdown is after BTS got individual Instagrams in December of 2021, V accidentally followed and immediately unfollowed Jenny on Instagram. I remember that. He went to Weaver's, which is BTS's Google because they come to us <laughs> shit all the time there. And he goes, is there a way to get rid of the recommended friends list here on this Insta thing? It's a scary app. He's so funny. Yeah. Okay. Fucking comedian. (laughs) Fucking comedian. (laughs) (laughs) So that was in December of 2021. Then in May of 2022, V was seen driving around in Jeju with allegedly Jenny in the passenger seat. This is what prompted G Dragon to unfollow her. Like it was sequential. So that's where it was like T. (laughs) T. Oh, T. Yeah. So airline employees claim to have seen them flying together in the open from like, you know, from Seoul to Jeju back and forth. So like, oh, we thought this was like an open thing that everybody knew that they were dating because they're not hiding from us. So YG stepped up with one of their earth shattering statements at this point. They said, we have nothing to say regarding this matter. (laughs) We will inform you if we have a different response to share. (laughs) Wow. Typical YG behavior. Girl, girl, YG be YGing and I (laughs) can't. (laughs) <laughs> so then in August, September of 2022, a bunch of pictures of them together dropped, which many fans claimed were photoshopped. Girl, okay, this is also linked from our blog so you can see the lengths to which fans went, like selecting a picture of, that, of her that existed and like overlaying it with transparencies over the pictures that were <laughs> like leaked. And they were like, this is what proves that she's photoshopped because she's making the same facial expression. I was like... Mm, she literally just said that that's what she does this you've gone to the dark place okay you've gone to the dark place as it turns out again the fans thought they were photoshopped but yg e basically confirmed that the pictures were leaked slash stolen from jenny's cloud because of a statement that they released in october and i want you all to hear me because I had never been able to talk about this openly and I just want to smack every single person over the head that I saw on Twitter because I don't think y'all have reading comprehension skills and we need to get it together, okay? Let's hear what YG had to say about this one. I'm taking notes. Thank you. We have officially requested the police to investigate who first circulated Blackpink Jenny's personal photos. YG has been consistently monitoring the matter and filed a lawsuit in September after collecting information. There have been indiscriminate rumors, criticism, personal attacks, sexual harassment, and violations of personal life sparked by those private photographs. We are now announcing that we will take legal action and correct the situation. For people who thought that this meant anything other than the pictures are real, y'all, I don't know how you pass the SATs. I guess you haven't taken them because people on Twitter were not reading what this was saying. 
this just stated that it was personal photos and private photos, which means that they were real. If not, they would have said these were fabricated, these were uh, photoshopped, these are fake, these are unfounded. But they said twice that these pictures were personal and private, a.k.a. they were real. Which means a lot because it's YG, known to make very broad statements vague this was not broad or vague at all nothing like if it doesn't i don't even think you need to read between the lines just read what is in front of you they are saying that the pictures were real like i don't know why everyone like okay and that aside obviously horrifying that jenny got her phone hacked terrible that her pictures got leaked obviously terrible that she was getting harassed and death threats and stuff i remember i took screenshots of some of the things little girls were writing on weavers to be it was ridiculous okay the things that i was reading like i wish i'm I'm gonna look for them and i'm gonna try to put them in the blog because (sighs) i remember these pictures and it was like after everything i've done for you you go with that (gasps) whore yeah it was like it was a whole thing so (sighs) i can only imagine the things she was getting because of course women get hatred while men get away with everything that is so fucking annoying to me she's not roping this these men she's she's like they're going out with her or they're dating her because they want to how is that her fault no i just I sorry don't she's it. hot like i don't like <laughs> i i don't understand i don't get it i think it's ridiculous obviously a lot of this is like children who are projecting yeah. their like marriage dreams onto groups so that's the only reason why i'm mentioning it because again i'm like i think we none of us like sat there and like had this discussion of like yg just admitted that the pictures were real and that they were dating basically without saying it it went over everybody's heads i I think we both were like oh yeah this is happening surprised nobody's really talking about it but yeah okay i was like okay october 2022 (laughs) we know that now it's like for real like thanks for the statement yg now we know but a lot of people didn't get it and that's that again reading comprehension let's work on it then in may of 2023 while v was in paris for the celine fashion show and jenny was in Cannes to promote the idol they were seen walking the streets of paris at night hype and yge i don't know if it was a joint statement or if it was just like both said the same thing but both said the same thing said, it is difficult to check regarding this matter on the artist's private lives. I guess everything rubs off, even the wrong or bad things. So, because Hybe Hybe had never put a more basic or vague statement in their entire lives. But whatever, it worked. Uh, People were saying that there were decoys. I remember there was a lot of, like, of the toxic armies that were being like, Jenny's dating a lookalike. She's obsessed with V. This is, like, her lookalike that she takes everywhere. And they had proof and shots like guys it was them i don't think the lookalike has the money for a celine jacket the 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 v was wearing it was them like the the way that they they were like no because she looks so much skinnier and and they don't walk like this it was them like let's let it go it was them (laughs) it was they had bodyguards guys like it was them it was it was it's you can't really like deny it at, at this point but whatever, that was in May. And then in December, once V enlisted in the military, rumors swirled that their relationship had ended. Even an article was published confirming the rumors on December 6th, the same day that the contract resigning was announced. Recurring theme, me thinks? I don't know. It's giving sus. I don't know what to tell you, but it's giving sus to me. Because when the contract was supposed to be resigned, Jisoo has her dating thing. And then when the contract was actually resigned, Jenny's news come out that she allegedly broke up with V when their relationship was never officially confirmed. I don't know how to spell it out, sis, but it's a lot. And the funniest part about this is that at that point, once a breakup was announced, then some fans, and I don't know if they were like pro or against relationship at this point, were in denial about the breakup because they started pulling receipts <laughs> of like Jenny posted a picture of food on a table that looked like the table at V's house. But all the pictures that were being referenced and in question were from late November. So if they broke up or the breakup was announced in early December, why is y'all pulling receipts from November saying they're still together? Yeah, they yeah. might have been at that point. Make it make sense. I just, I'm tired. I'm tired of the lack of readership skills up in here. And then the last scandal, nothing related to Jenny's dating life at all. Thankfully, poor girl, leave her alone. Let her date who she wants. I'm so over this. The entirety of her work on The Idol. Spicy meter, 
not even the first wing on hot ones if you've seen that show like that's usually like sriracha or nothing the lowdown there's there was like three different issues with her participation on this show number one when the trailer dropped fans spotted her wearing cornrows and they were saying that this was cultural appropriation i'm i'm not here to state whether it was or not because that's not my place what i will say is when you participate on a show you don't get a say on how your hair is done, how your makeup is done, or what you wear. So they basically canceled Jenny in South Korea for participating in the show at all because of the raunchy dialogue and the graphic sex scenes. I think it was a choice, for sure, for her to like participate yeah. in this. But this is where her socialite status comes in. Because we've seen her going to Coachella, and we know that like The weekend probably reached out, or Lily Rose Depp, or whatever. Somebody was like, girl, come be in the show. And she was like, but... So I don't think it was the best choice for her in a way, but there is an article that debates that and we'll link it also from the blog about how this was actually a very smart choice for her to participate on the idol. And she didn't walk away with any like scars from being on the show. If anything, her acting was praised and she was one of the more likable characters that had a tremendous potential for having a crazy arc and then the show threw it all away. She did. I never watched the show because I that's not the type of shows that I watch, yeah. but I did watch a lot of YouTube commentary on mm-hmm. the show. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the people that I watched said the same thing that like they could have taken her storyline to something like better. Yeah. But they tremendously underused her and yeah. that for the most part she was pretty likable. Yeah. Even yeah, though her, her 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 role wasn't like she was kind of a villain role. Likeable. Like it wasn't right, it wasn't a right. good girl role, but it was she did it well and she performed yeah. and yeah, it was it was good. But yeah. again, everything that was criticized of her <clears throat> negatively in this instance, like they even fired the director for trying to make the show make sense. So yeah. I don't think she should be held accountable for choices that were made for her. No. Anyway. And I don't have a final rating for Jenny, but you can decide how you feel. And I just think People need to leave her alone. Yeah. So moving on to Rosé. Rosie. I think she like introduces herself as Rosie. But yeah. So the first scandal is the Kill This Love MV. Spicy meter traffic ticket. <laughs> Pretty much the whole issue that netizens or I guess maybe in this case is uh, Korean society had was mm-hmm. that she was shown not wearing a seatbelt in the music video and like that's it i guess like as a parent if you think that blackpink are like role models to your kids you want them to like set an example but you can't expect these women to set an example in every instance of like their lives and this is art this is like art and this is not them (laughs) like this is yg if you want to be mad at someone be mad at yg the second scandal (laughs) so stupid she wrote a happy birthday post to jisoo <laughs> spicy meter it's the sound of the grammar police so pretty much rose posted an instagram wishing jisoo a happy birthday and used the phrase i i can't nomo, say nomo. it it's nomo, nomo. yeah but she spelled it like a certain way mm to express the words like really really mm-hmm. and in the way that she wrote it was basically what in South Korea they called an ilbe term, which just stands for Ilgen Best, which is like a far right website and like movement. So once she realized her mistake, she fixed the post and that was that. It was honestly giving like our clueless parents sending like a meme of Pepe the Frog. Like literally the connotations are there, but like if you don't know, you don't know. You know what I mean? Right. There's no harm intended right. there. And then the last one is her alleged drug use. Spicy meter tastes like chili. And in terms of that, the Burberry chief of something, I didn't write what it, what he was, but he was a Burberry. One of right. the C-level, C-suite officers. Thank you. Posted a picture of a group of people like at a house party having a mm. good time and rose was in it along with like a south korean actor and netizens being netizens claimed that like if you like zoomed into the picture you could see that there were drugs in the background i have seen these pictures they're so pixelated that there's no fucking way like there's no fucking way anyway 
the picture was uh, deleted and YG strongly denied these allegations and threatened legal action. Ooh. Rating is netizens. Do you even know what a scandal is? It's like these are these are not these are not scandals. Like not at all. By all of you. And last but not least, we have <laughs> Lisa. So Lisa has basically the re scandals, I believe. Yeah. So the first one is appropriation, which is a recurring scandal for her. Spicy meter, mild for most, Diablo level for others, if you like Taco Bell hot sauces. And so I want to address this with sensitivity because, as I said earlier, most of these appropriation scandals don't affect us, don't involve like Hispanic people, Latin heritage, Hispanic heritage. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that I can accept or deny. We're just kind of like talking about the situation. In some instances, things have been clarified. In some instances, things have been distorted and blown out of proportion completely unnecessarily. And in other instances, people were right. And so I think we can talk about all of them with decorum and just objectively. So Lisa was accused of cultural appropriation several times. One time was for wearing box braids in her Money music video. She was also accused of appropriation when people said she wore a do-rag in the Kill This Love music video. Now, the caveat here is the director, whose name is Anthony King, is Black, and he posted photos to the stories because he was getting flag, I guess, from people because when they mm-hmm. saw her wearing the, which, which turned out to be a scarf, not a do-rag, they were saying that it was appropriation because she was not Black and she shouldn't be wearing a do-rag. And he said... Um, I've worn a do-rag my whole life. I know what one looks like. This is not a do-rag because if it doesn't give me waves, it's not a do-rag. And then he posted another story going into a little bit more detail. Like I, as a black man, if I had seen her wearing a do-rag, I would not have shot this video. It's not a, it's not a do-rag. It's a scarf. Like I'm guaranteeing you as a black man, I know what it looks like and that's not it. So that was cleared up. People are just ignorant or I don't know, but love to sound the fire alarm for no freaking reason. Cry wolf. And then when the wolf actually shows up, no one's going to believe you. And she also was called out for wearing a quote unquote metallic do-rag. Guys, it's called chain mail and it's a medieval thing. You can't appropriate medieval times (laughs) as a whole. Like, can we can we get on the same page about what things like if you see mesh created out of metal rings, it's called chain mail. It's it's a thing. It's used as like a fashion statement. It was a medieval thing. I don't know if there's any roots somewhere of this being a racist thing. I I don't. But I, as far as I know, and as I can see, and as I researched, it's just a protection that was used during medieval times so that the sword wouldn't go through your clothes. It was meant yeah. to trap the sword. So she was wearing during kingdom, a beautiful metallic chain mail situation on her head. And people chose yeah. to call it a metallic do-rag because, right. again, netizens be netizing. And so that was stupid. Now, the one instance, as I mentioned, where many fans agreed that there was disrespect at play was during the How You Like That music video where there was a moment where Lord Ganesha was placed below the throne that Lisa was sitting on. This was seen as normalization of disrespecting Desi culture. The complaints were bad enough that... YG decided to remove digitally the image from the music video and then re-upload it without him placed in that area where it was seen that he was below the throne. And even the New York Times got in on this one because clout, of course. I think, again, this is another thing where I know Lisa did not participate in the set design of like the props and things like that. So more of the responsibility for me goes to the, the set people and yg as a whole i read a lot about this because there there are a lot of scandals with idols where it keeps coming up that they should be cultured enough at this point to understand sensitivities to race and culture and religion and other things the excuse or the reasoning is korea was sheltered from the world and they were not getting like outside influence from the 40s to the 90s And even then, what they got was, like, their interpretation of what they were seeing. There were apparently even campaigns of, like, let's learn from Hollywood. So whatever they were learning was almost like a parody of real life. And Mm. so it doesn't seem like a lot of what happens is malicious. At this point, though, obviously, especially big three companies, big four, should know better. They've gotten enough complaints when they shouldn't be doing, like, 
there's been moments where I, I believe I read something about them wearing bindis too and stuff. So like yeah, yeah. they keep doing it over and over and over in like a new way. So y'all should know better at this point. Like everyone should know better. I think companies should make it a part of their training time, not just about looking sultry with your eyes, but like if you're going to be touring the world and going to other countries, you should know what cultural sensitivities there are. Like they should really have a DNI council they DNI should something because yeah. it affects their bottom line yeah i mean aside from it being terrible but also like it affects financially it's just smart yeah so it doesn't make it i've never understood why they don't do this they should have people on the reg you know on on site at all times making yeah. sure that no one's gonna get offended like there's and, cultural experts for this and i i'm not trying to i guess take responsibility away from artists mm. but for stuff like this where it's not on their person or it's like a music video that is not their solo work but like as a group Korea also has a very big culture of respect for like authority figures so I can imagine that it can't be that easy to go against not just one person, but a whole team of people yeah. telling you what to do. Absolutely. So again, this doesn't apply all the time. And there are times where they're appropriating like consciously. Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes I think the big issue goes to the company and not the idol. Yeah, I'd say the majority of the but times for sure. Anyway, her next scandal is a little bit more fun. And I, I know it, it's hard to talk about the dating scandals because... I want them to live their personal lives privately yeah. as they choose. And I, I don't want to talk about this like I'm a tabloid, but that caveat, this relationship to me is very fun. So the Same. spicy meter is more like hot tea. OK, that's that's the vibes here. And I'm going to read it word for word just because I had so much fun writing this that I think it'll come out more concise if I just read it. So <laughs> Louis Vuitton, Celine, Givenchy, Kenzo, Dior, Fendi, Sephora. Makeup Forever, Benefit Cosmetics, Fenty Beauty, Tiffany, Tag Heuer, Bulgari, Hublot, and 61 other brands have one thing in common. They all fall under the LVMH Cinematic Universe, the world's largest luxury goods company, reporting over 86 billion euros in annual revenue in 2023. And one of the heirs to this massive empire, Frederick, is allegedly Lisa's boo. Get Frederick, Al <laughs> I know, I'm so excited. Frederick Arnold is the son of LVMH CEO Bernard Arnold and the CEO of LVMH watches as of January 2024. He was originally like the chief innovation person for Tag Heuer. Then he was the CEO of Tag Heuer. And now he's the CEO of LVMH watches as a whole. So like every Ooh. watch company that is under LVMH, he's overseeing. And he's allegedly like it, like he has actually brought a lot of innovation and he's like, cause apparently Tag Heuer back in the day was almost at like the Rolex level and it kind of died down, but he's brought it back. So he's it allegedly, I don't know. So, so yeah, so he's been the CEO of LVMH watches as of January 24. He and Lisa have often been photographed at events. And if they were to be in a relationship, they undoubtedly have the best cover up with her being an ambassador for both Celine and Bulgari, which are two of the houses under LVMH. All their fashion and jewelry engagements, like their recent appearance in Miami, they were here for a Bulgari event a couple of weeks ago, in early February with Frederick's brother and his wife for Bulgari are understandable. But him showing up to Coachella and many other performances, the dinners in Paris and all over the world, the car pickups, et cetera, et cetera, it's not looking strictly business. And add to that, that her phone case has the letters F.A. embossed. And I'm sorry, it's giving ship. Girl. So I, and like all this to say also when I was like doing the research, I'm like, wait, but Jisoo is also like doing stuff with Dior and I, Tiffany, I believe, or I don't know what other jewelry she's, Cartier. That's, that's Rosé. Rosé is, is with oh, Tiffany okay. and Jisoo is with Cartier. Okay, so, you know, these, at least Dior is also under LVMH. So she's also hung out with Frederick, but they don't have nearly as much appearances together. And yeah, it's just, it's giving ship. I love this for her because, wow, so smart. Instead of dating a dusty, crusty idol, this girl said, dusty, let me marry the son 
of the second richest man in the world behind <laughs> only Elon Musk. Allegedly, because at this point, I don't know how much money he has. But right, right, right. Bernard is literally the almost wealthiest man in the world. Wow. Get it, Lisa. Uh, Get it, Lisa. She's so smart. I love she's her. She's it, man. She's it. Okay. And her last scandal, which is fairly recent, is mm -hmm. crazy horse. So spicy meter Jesus horse Christ. radish. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the lowdown is a Parisian cabaret known for its stage shows performed by nude female dancers and for the diverse range of magic and variety turns between each nude show and the next called the Crazy Horse Saloon was the home to Lisa for a mini residency. It was like a like a weekend, a couple of shows, like a, over a week. And although she did not partake in a nude performance, China, the country, has extremely stringent policies against shows that promote obscenity and nudity. So her Weibo page, for those of you who don't know what Weibo is, it's like their Facebook. It's their one of their biggest social media pages. She has a page on there that's like verified, just like you would have on Instagram or Facebook anywhere else. That page was shut down and it, it was claimed that it was because she was against the rules of the community or something like that. Not only hers, but two Chinese actresses who went to see the show, including Angela Baby, very famous, also faced Weibo page shutdowns. So shortly after Lisa's Weibo account was taken down, her images from the Weibo page of two big luxury brands that she's an ambassador for, which are Bulgari and Celine, were deleted. Like every picture that those pages had of Lisa in them were gone. And I mean, you could say that like, did this affect her really? Because obviously China is a huge market. Yeah. But at the end of the day, her relationships with both brands and her boo who oversees Wait. both brands, it still stands. So I don't really think that her brand relationships were affected. And P.S., her alleged in-laws, like the parents of Frederick, I know, went to the know. show because everybody lives like in Europe. They went to the show, but like, she wasn't nude. It, it wasn't like I know, that. but still, I don't know. Well, French people are made different, I guess. Yeah, I guess. They, yeah, the, No, that's not an I guess. I know. Yes, they are. <laughs> French people are made very different. So that's that's what makes sense. <laughs> and that's it for the scandals for Lisa's. I guess the summary is, I mean, you pick and you choose what you want to be mad about. If you really want to be mad about her be performing in like a nude performance situation where she wasn't nude. I think she's always talked about wanting to live in Paris. And now that she has a French boo, it's just like perfect. I mean, maybe he's Swiss. I don't know. But, you know, from that region. So that's that. And from there, we're going to jump to talk about their solo careers, and their work outside of music. So as we mentioned, their contracts were up in August of 2023. Mm -hmm. We were in a very long period of uncertainty mm -hmm. as to what was going to happen to Blackpink as mm -hmm. a group. Kathy and I probably talked about this at least like bi-weekly. At least. <laughs> Wondering what was going to happen because it's it, it's very big news like very them resigning is not just oh they're gonna stay together it's literally money yeah like it, it stocks for yg went like up and down like it was it was insane it was an yg insane had time. to make statements for once in their life like actually make statements and say no decisions have happened but we're still talking so hold your horses so i think we can share our opinion on this mm. particularly me me personally i didn't think they were going to sign again with yg even though obviously being together as a group brings them a lot of money mm -hmm. um, because groups are stronger than individuals because in general at least outside of them doing this tour together it doesn't seem like their careers or their aspirations are going towards the same goal mm -hmm. and so I didn't see it would be something that they wanted to continue mm. right because like when you look at all four of them they're doing very different things within their own realms right so it just felt like maybe it would be better for them to just leave YG and do their own thing right yeah so that that was my opinion yeah that we both felt the same way in that regard, I 
didn't think, honestly, especially after the last tour, there was a lot of footage of Lisa performing at a completely different energy and just level than the rest of the members. And not that that's the only deciding factor, but if you guys are not in sync, and I don't mean like literally synced up to the bone of like the same exact body movements, but in the energy output and how you feel on stage, yeah. I just didn't see how that could move forward personally. So I was extremely surprised when they all resigned with YG because, yeah. again, I, I just I don't understand how they make sense. And what Laura said is very valid also. Of like if they're not going towards the same end goal, then like where is the match? Where where does that go? And the, the one key thing that I want to add here is even though the contract was renewed, we don't know for how long that's true that so it could true. have been a year it could have been three years because typically renewals unless you're sm and keeping people hostage are shorter the second yeah. round like they're they ter they're typically one to three years so right. i'm very right. intrigued to know for how long they actually resigned yeah like especially like one of the things that really popped out of me is especially jenny trying to break into like the western mm -hmm. market by starring or participating in the weekend show mm -hmm. it just felt like she's trying to maybe not get rid of but going a little bit away from an idol image to branch more out of like a global star right yeah, like agreed not just a k-pop girl group member but just jenny what is the versatile she... international pop star she called her jenny ruby ruby jenny yeah jenny, jenny ruby jane is so that's her name for everyone like not her, her brand in <laughs> yeah, her brand. Agreed. So they announced in December that the members had joined or re-signed with YG for Blackpink activities, but that they were going to do their solo work separately. And we were kind of waiting to see what separately meant. Mm -hmm. And so with that, let's talk about Jisoo. So Jisoo, aside from being a member of Blackpink, is now an actor. She debuted in 2021 with Snowdrop, which was a Disney Plus series. It had huge success for the platform, and she won a Outstanding Korean Actress at Seoul International Drama Awards. There was a little bit of a scandal for the show because people said that it wasn't historically accurate. But aside from that, people did praise her acting in particular. Yeah, I think from... any, any show that deals with North Korea historically has some level of controversy with it. And right. just a side note, if you guys want to know about more K-pop related content on Disney+, Plus, we do have a blog up on our page that is like Disney is in its K-pop era. And it talks about mm -hmm. all the things that you can find from K-pop idols or K-drama across Disney Plus and Hulu because Hulu belongs to Disney. And then aside from being an actor, like I mentioned earlier, she's a fashion icon mm. to me in particular. Mm. She's a, a global ambassador for Dior. So to put this into perspective, because when I was looking into this, I was like, no fucking way. This is ridiculous. In like a wow way not like right. you know what the fuck you know right <laughs> so she was ranked as the reason for dior sales increase in south korea in 2020 that's wild during paris fashion week 2021 for spring summer four of her photos were valued at 1.4 million dollars that's wild so dior had about 8,000 social media posts that valued about 39.1 million in media impact value that's crazy. And out of those 39.1, 15.7 million came from two of Jisoo's posts. That's wild. Ridiculous. That's wild. Ridiculous. She uh, is also a model for Cartier. She is a style icon for women in South Korea and like K poppies in general. They pretty much emulate all of her looks. And she continuously ranks on the top 10 for individual brand reputation rankings like continuously mm -hmm. she's done multiple endorsements with dyson samsonite lg electronics nikon just to name a few in 2023 she debuted uh, musically as a solo artist with her single album me the title track flower 
was the most expensive Blackpink music video per YG Entertainment. Sí. <laughs> Rolling Stone ranked it number 67 on their list of the 100 best songs of 2023. The music video, as of yesterday, February 20th, has 469 million views. And she won at Mama 2023 best music video and best dance performance by a female soloist which if i can just pause heavy dose of bfr yeah. like again i don't know if you guys can tell but i really like jisoo however i know her limitations and dancing is not her strongest suit her strongest suit so Naming her best dance solo performance when 2023 was the year for the girl groups and the girl soloists. So if you just think about everyone that came out with songs in 2023, I'm just going to go knock, knock. You know what I mean? Knock, even knock. even if we are not talking about her, it's just the choreography was not all that like it to wasn't. start with. Like the song is very slow and the choreography wasn't crazy. So you could do it. And that's how you know it wasn't ridiculous because <laughs> exactly. I could do it like anyway still love her she's great yes and actually just today february 21st jisoo announced officially the opening the start of her own entertainment company for her solo activities called blisu which is a mesh of bliss and jisoo <laughs> love that for her makes sense Allegedly, it's under her brother's company, Biomom. And we had little bits of like teasers here and there when Blisu posted a job ad with Jisoo's picture and her stylist posted photos of Jisoo and like wrote Blisu underneath, like in the caption. So it, it was like not even, I guess, that much of a secret. <laughs> Some secrets in Korea are truly like everybody knows we're just not going to talk about it and pretend when someone turns all the lights. Surprise. Yeah. OK, well, with that, we move on to Jenny. So Jenny was the first to debut solo when it came to music in the group by releasing the straightforward solo, a minimalistic pop single that showcases both her sweet timbre and sassy rap lines. Mm -hmm. It topped Billboard's World Digital Songs charts and became the most viewed music video by a female Korean solo artist within 24 hours on YouTube. She hasn't really had an official comeback since, but she has been performing the, the solo that she released very recently called You and Me as part of the set list for the Born Pink World Tour. And aside from that one, Jenny and Lily Rose Depp arrived triumphantly at the top of the Billboard Hot 100 for the first time, thanks to their collaboration with The Weeknd, one of the girls from HBO's The Idol. I mean, I think TikTok really helped with that one because the edits yeah. like gave it everything. So the song was released in June of last year via HBO, XO and Republic Records, debuted at number 100 with 6 million U.S. streams and 1.5 million radio audience impressions from December 15th to December 21st. So that's her solo music part. On YouTube, Jenny launched her YouTube channel called Jenny Ruby Jane on her 25th birthday, which was January 16th, 2021. Within 24 hours, she accumulated over 1.75 million subscribers and became the second most subscribed YouTube user within the time frame following a Brazilian singer called Marilia Diaz Mendonça. And Jenny Ruby Jane official surpassed 10 million subscribers, making her the only K-pop soloist to achieve this feat. And then just like Jisoo announced today, Jenny had her moment as well with Odd Atelier. On December 23rd, 2023, she took to Instagram to announce her new endeavor called Odd Atelier. She said that this was a year filled with many accomplishments and she's so thankful for all the love and that she's excited about what's to come as she starts her solo journey this year with a company that she's established. Please show lots of love for my new start with OA and of course, Blackpink. Thank you. So we'll see what comes. I think they only have like four posts. They're all of her black and white. She has her aesthetic. It's very, it's giving. Yeah. So on the fashion modeling side, just like Laura mentioned, Jisoo's influence. I didn't go in that much detail about the numbers for Jenny, but there's very similar comparisons to what the power that they hold when it comes to influencing and fashion. During a performance for her 2018 solo single called Solo, she stocked hairpins on either side of her face and the look got so much attention that people dubbed it Jenny's hairpins. It was like simple bobby pins, but 
Jenny made it a thing. And it's not something new or unique by any means, but she wore it. So, of course, everybody had to go crazy over it. She became an ambassador for Chanel in 2019, and she wears the brand so often that Blinks have called her the human Chanel, which is cute, I guess. She was a contributing editor for Vogue Korea, Vogue Korea's March 2021 issue, planning photo shoots, deciding on the concepts, and styling hair, makeup, and clothes, all of which she then modeled herself on the cover. And in 2021, she also had her debut as a talent for the new Heron Preston for Calvin Klein campaign. And in 2023, she had her own Calvin Klein capsule collection where she had a whole like launch party in Korea. Jungkook showed up, but like they never interacted. It was a whole thing because, you know, BTS and Blackpink, the floor is lava. It's a thing like <laughs> VN, like VM and Lisa were not on the same plane for 12 hours going to Paris Fashion Week. And no, we're gonna never. All you don't talk about that. <laughs> never, never, girl. I'm over it. And then acting as we were talking about. She participated in The Idol with her character named Diane, who is a dancer and singer wannabe. Her success in the music industry is undeniable. And this is, again, what I was saying earlier that I had read uh, this article that was saying how this was actually a very smart choice for her because she could have created a new career for herself within South Korea, where she's already very known. And any drama studio people would have been salivating at the prospect of giving her a starring role but instead she chose to go abroad and start establishing herself as an international versatile queen and to me she's also maybe too spicy for korean society. yes yeah so, i think she's over it i think yeah. to me out of the four of them she's the most over pretending that she's not a human and she's yeah. the most comfortable with, like, being who she is, living her life, dating who she dates, and doing what she wants to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't think she she wants to be confined to Korean standards and not get married until she's 55. And, right. like, the people already dubbed her useless, you know, I, I which right. is good for her. So, yeah, mm -hmm. again, she was cast in The Idol. Her character, Diane, was a hit worldwide despite the poor ratings of the show. And they didn't do justice to what was shaping up to be a showgirl storyline that could have killed. But So Rose, she had her solo debut in 2021 with R. On the ground, the title track broke the record for most viewed video by a Korean soloist in 24 hours when it came out. On the ground is all in English and autobiographical. It peaked at number 70 on Billboard's Hot 100. And as of yesterday, February 20th, it had 355 million views on YouTube. In terms of fashion, she's her, she stands on her own two feet. Her blonde hair has been part of her fashion image for a very long time. She's been a shade of blonde since 2019. A note from us, please give your scalp a break. Like, oh, there's no thing. fucking way. Like, there's no fucking way her hair is healthy. Like, honestly, wigs are a thing. Ariana Grande and Lady Gaga have worn wigs for years, a long time. Mm. And it's fine. Beyonce. Beyonce looks gorgeous with a wig, without a wig. You can do it too. Fox. In 2022, she went from platinum to strawberry blonde, and Team Vogue wrote a whole article about it. That's her reach. And that's why I think her blonde hair is like part of her fashion image, her whatever iconosity or whatever the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> She's a global ambassador for YSL, the first global ambassador in 59 years. Wow. A post of Rose wearing a black YSL dress generated $6. $6 million dollars in media value that's fucking insane she alongside cl from 21 attended the met gala in 2021 and became one of the first female k-pop idols to attend and she was a talk of the of the evening like everybody was like rosie from blackpink like they were talking as they were in line to go upstairs and you could mm -hmm. see the cameras in the back i think it was Haley weaver talking to kendall jenner or something about it so Everybody wanted to see her. She was the talk hey. of town. In my personal opinion, her dress was whatever. But she's also a global ambassador for Tiffany & Co. And or in terms of a solo company, it's just rumors, rumors, rumors and rumors for right now. Nothing has been confirmed. However, on February 11th, 2024, she posted a song snippet on Instagram of a song that she's been working on which i'm gonna just go ahead and call it vampire holly 
I don't know. Just it's a weird it's it's giving very singer songwriter like <laughs> indie girl, you know, and she also questionably interestingly asked her fans to give themselves a fandom name. I guess that I thought that was kind of weird. Interesting. Yeah. Like, isn't it blinks? <laughs> I mean, according to God seven, they to this day are like, yeah, God says I don't need another name for anything. Right. So, so that was that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. choice. Okay. Very big. Very big. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And last but not least, Lisa's solo life. So six months after Rosé, Lisa dropped her own. I don't know why people call this an album, but it's like a single album. It has two songs, yeah. which is Money and La Lisa. And I think they dropped it with like instrumental versions. So it's like four songs. Yeah. Oh, sure. It was <laughs> the highest first week sales among all Korean female acts with 700,036 with 222 copies sold. La Lisa obviously was a reference to her birth name. She referenced her Thai roots. Like it was a serve. I I at first wasn't sure about La Lisa because I don't like repetition a lot. And so Lisa love me, love me. It was like a lot for me, but I, it grew on me. But money, I loved money from day one. Like Ooh, I think money, money was, was the money shot. Mm. Both La Lisa and money charted on Billboard Top 100 at number 84 and number 90 respectively. And the latter became the first song by a female K-pop soloist to chart for multiple weeks. Later on October 2021, Lisa furthered her global appeal by co-writing and co-composing on SG, which was a Moonbaton collaboration with DJ Snake, Osuna, and Megan Thee Stallion. In 2022, she became the first solo K-pop artist to win both an MTV Video Music Award for Best K-pop Video for La Lisa and an MTV Europe Music Award for Best K-pop. Which is kind of rude because I don't consider her solo work K-pop. I mean, maybe La Lisa because it had some Korean in it, but money was completely in English and it wasn't giving K-pop. Right. And if it's like, is it because the person who sings it, then it should be T-pop. Nothing, nothing ever makes sense. We're living the upside yeah. down. In terms of fashion, again, I didn't look into the metrics because that's not my jam. But in <laughs> July of 2020, she was selected as a global ambassador for Bulgari. And in September of 2020, she was selected to be a global ambassador for Celine around the same time. Well, no, not the same time because V became ambassador much later. But Park Boyan also is another oh. ambassador. So the three of them do these cute little appearances. I They're mean, so now cute. V is serving. So Lisa stands in the middle and has to pretend to ignore V and V has to pretend to ignore her when he's been dating her friend for <laughs> two years. But OK, Sure. Let's all ignore each other and not say that we were on a flying <laughs> tube together for 12 hours. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, and I, yeah, and I'm sure her pictures are valued. I, look it up. Be like Laura. Look it up yourselves. <laughs> do the research and find out how much her media value is when she shows up at an event wearing a piece of clothing from one of her brands that she represents. Interestingly, though, when it comes to Guinness records, Lisa holds seven of them, which is more than any K-pop solo artist. She holds them because of being the most followed K-pop artist on Instagram, which at the time that they gave her the award, she had 90.7 million followers, which is also the most out of any artist outside of the Americas. And even ever since then, she now has over 100 million followers. She was also confirmed by Guinness in April of 2022, as the first solo K-pop artist to create an album that gets 1 billion streams on Spotify, with her debut also called La Lisa. And later in September, she broke another record when her single Money also hit the 10-digit mark for streams. Which is a lot of streams. But she deserves every single one of them. Yeah, La Lisa okay. racked up 73.6 million views in one day, making it the most viewed video in 24 hours in YouTube music video history, either by a solo K-pop artist or a solo artist period and she also became the first solo k-pop winner at the mtv music video awards as well as the first solo k-pop winner at the mtv europe music awards and i think i guess for that she qualifies for guinness like i don't know how guinness works on those I things but either. sure they also won an award like as a group for best metaverse performance for their performance of the new single ready for love in the video game for PUBG. interesting very interesting gaining an additional guinness world records title for being the first winners of the award you got here first girly she is thailand's pride I wanted to look into this more deeply, but there literally is so much information. It would take me half an hour to go over all of the endorsements, ambassadorships, and everyone else that is throwing money at Lisa in Thailand. 
like whenever you go there, it's either Bam Bam or her on every billboard ever. And it's mostly her. <laughs> but I'll name a couple of specific highlights. AIS, which is the leading telecom mobile operator of the country, was rumored to be her first major sponsorship in Thailand in the eight digits, which was a huge deal. And then she had a Thai endorsement deal with a food company for what was estimated to be around $440,000, which is a lot of money. Then I read somewhere else that they said that like her fee two years ago was $600,000 to like be an ambassador or, or promote literally anything, which is a shit ton of money. Just for promoting something. Just promote. for promoting something, like for taking a picture with something and a product and calling it a day. And very importantly and very nicely, in October of 2023, she received the Leader Cultural Ambassador Award given to her by the Thailand's Ministry of Culture. And then as far as a label, our girl also said, I'm going to do this on my own. She announced the creation of a new record label called Loud with two L's in an Instagram post on February 8th, calling it a platform to showcase my vision in music and entertainment. There isn't a uh, concise information just yet on whether... It's going to be just her signed to this place or she's going to sign more talent. I think she will sign more talent. But the newest development that has come up as of the last couple of weeks is that Lisa is also going to have her acting debut by joining season three of The White Lotus alongside Jennifer Coolidge. You didn't know that. I'm and sure. a couple of other that. actors that are uh, very well known. And, and the show won a lot of awards during this past award season. And so that's amazing. Yeah. Good for her. Uh -huh. I think she made a better choice than Jenny in terms of picking shows to do abroad, if right. you ask me. So, yeah, that's that's our girl, Lisa. I like her. She's great. I guess I hadn't come to the realization that we're not really links, but we really do like them as people and their talents individually. Yeah. yeah. It's just together as a group, we're not completely sold. Yeah. Yeah. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode where, again, we're not super stands, so different vibes than we usually have when it comes to groups. Mm. And let us know who else you want us to talk about, Please. because we will. But to be quite honest, some groups do overwhelm us. Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> anyway. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the MIA2K podcast. We have lots of great content coming up ahead. So please don't forget to follow and subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you enjoyed our episodes, please rate us five stars. And for the real time tea, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook by searching for at MIA2K Podcast. Dale. Bye.